Okay, so next speaker is Christian Moraes Smith, topological varma superfluid in optical lattices. Or actually, he has changed the title: ultra cold atom in optical lattice, shaken and stirred. Please. Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to talk to you, although I am very far. Uh, we will try to tell you some things that are going on in my. I will give half of the talk, and my PH, ex PhD student, who is already a doctor now, Anton Quelle, is going to give the other half. So uh, the title I have chosen is Shaken and Disturbed, and I will be telling you about the shaken part, and he will tell about circular shaking, which is stir stirring. Very good. So we have been involved into the ideas of Feynman and how to construct a quantum simulator to use one many-body quantum system to simulate properties of another one, which is inaccessible or more difficult to realize. So you use one that you can tune to try to understand properties of the other. And ultra-cold atoms are ideal systems to play as quantum simulators. One of the seminal examples was the realization of the Bose-Hubbard model. So you have a system where you have an optical lattice, which is like the egg box with the bosons sitting there. They can hop from side to side and they interact via Hubbard U, a repulsive Hubbard U. So in the moment when the, the, the hopping is more important, you are able to see in k-space a condensation at zero momentum. This is the peak at momentum k equals zero that you see here in time of flight experiments. And if you now start raising the height of these barriers, you will see that you will start seeing first order harmonics until the moment when you lose your condensate, your image gets blurred, and this is because now they are not condensing at the same momentum. They don't have any longer the same phase. But you went, you went into a multi insulating state where the number of particles now is very well defined. So the experimental observation of this phenomenon has been a breakthrough in terms of realizing models, model Hamiltonians. So when we use a drive, we can play even further with uh, our kinds of systems that we can simulate. And a very typical case is when you use a time uh, periodic driving. So you will then realize a Hamiltonian, which is periodic in time with period capital T. The systems are called Floquet systems. And then the solutions for this kind of system is going to be analogous to what we have for, for the Bloch problem in the lattices, with the difference that space now maps into time. And you will see that your solutions Psi can now be written in terms of these U's, which are periodic. And you have this factor that depends on En, where these En are the quasi-energies corresponding to the Floquet Hamiltonian which is now written as your h of t minus i h bar d dt. Anton is going to tell you a bit more about the Floquet model, but I suppose in this conference you might have heard a lot already about it. The person whom you're trying to reach is currently unavailable.
Hello? A gente se perdeu, né? Caiu a conexão. Caiu a conexão. Vamos tentar de novo. Ok. Share screen. Share your entire screen. Start. Vocês estão me vendo? Sim. Slide show, play from current slide. Ok. Ok. Okay. ok, so here is where I think the connection stopped working. The simplest example that we can uh, have is that one when we take a one-dimensional lattice with our boson sitting here, and now we are going to shake this lattice horizontally. You can do it by shaking the mirrors that is creating this lattice. So in the limit of very high frequency, when the frequency is much larger than the hopping or the Hubbard U, it turns out that you can rewrite this problem as a Hubbard model with just an effective hopping, uh, hopping parameter J, which is the previous hopping that you had before, multiplied by a Bessel function, J0 of first order, which is a function of the amplitude of the shaking divided by the frequency of the shaking. So if you remember, the Bessel function is something that starts in one, comes down to zero, gets negative down to minus 0, 0,4, and then oscillates around zero, okay? So if you look at this behavior of J0, you can immediately see that your effective hopping now it starts with the value you had originally. And as you start ramping the perturbation, you will have your hopping vanishing, your effective hopping, changing sign, and becoming positive again, but smaller. And this means that by tuning this, uh, uh, this shaking, I am a duration here in the figure in blue, where first, I have all the atoms in the first vertical line here, all the atoms condensing at k equals zero. This is 2 pi and minus 2 pi. And I, when I start ramping the time-dependent perturbation, as long as my J0 is still positive, I am still seeing the atoms condensing at the k equals zero momentum here. But then when the effective hopping goes to zero because J0 has a zero, I, my image here in K space gets blurred and I go into a multi insulating phase. Even more interesting is that as time goes by, if I get a negative J0, I am no longer in an upward parabola, but in a downward parabola. And now we are condensing at plus pi and minus pi at the boundaries of the Brillouin zone. That's why now I have a finite momentum condensate has moved here. And when I reach the next zero of the Bessel function, I get again another Mott insulator. And when I get positive again, I recover my zero momentum condensate, although the red dots are slightly small because now I, I am having a smaller amplitude for the hopping J. So it is very nice because this experiment that was performed in the group of Arimondo in Pisa could completely trace back the behavior of the Bessel function that is renormalizing the hopping in this model. Okay, I explained this in detail. It is already a while that this is known because I'm going to use it later. But then people have been shaking not only in one-dimensional lattices, but also in, for instance, two-dimensional triangular lattices. This was done in the group of Klaus Engstock in Hamburg, and this was very interesting because with these setups, you can simulate magnetism for your bosons and get spirals or frustration and so on. So it was a very interesting setup to play with. And one of the things that in the afterwards, this has been also used to shake in more complicated ways, which is basically one of the parts that Anton is going to tell you, if you shake circularly, okay? But I will stay with linear shaking. 
So uh, immediately when we started working on that, I was aware of some works that occur in the honeycomb lattice. You know that the graphene lattice has diracons because T, T, and T prime, the hop. Oi, a gente se perdeu de novo, né? Tá meio instável. Deixa eu tentar voltar. Ok, acho que estamos de volta. Sorry, uh, we are back. So, if we now have the graphene lattice, and if we are able to manipulate and change one of the hopping parameters here, at the moment when this hopping parameter becomes equal to twice the other ones, this is T and this is T, what will happen is that the jitter cone will become now a parabola in one direction and a jitter cone in the other one. And as you increase the prime further, the system will open a gap and you will lose your jitter cones. So people had been studying this in some kind of organic compounds. And the question I had at that time in 2012, when Selma Corre was doing her master thesis in my group, was can we do this by shaking? So what Selma has been working on, it was on the merging uh, of Dirac cones in a shaken honeycomb lattice. And the idea was to start with a static honeycomb lattice by getting lasers with three lasers with 120 degrees, put these ultra cold atoms at the minimum. And now we will shake in two ways. The shaking number one, we are going to shake perpendicularly to D1. And the second way of shaking will be along G1. Okay? So, in the moment when... Oops. I can't move. Uh, yes. Now I did. So, the graphene Hamiltonian has the A and B sublattices because of the honeycomb. It's a triangular Breve lattice with a basis A and B. And we have first neighbor, so nearest neighbor hopping, next nearest neighbor hopping within the same sublattice from A to A, B to B, and a chemical potential in the A and B sublattices. And now we put a shaking perturbation along a certain direction. And we are able to rewrite the hopping terms The person whom you're trying to reach is currently unavailable. Please leave. Oi. Opa lá. Ok. Deixa 
show your entire screen. Let's see if it now gets better when you call me. I am sorry for all these interruptions. Okay, I restart with this slide. I am not sure where you lost. So we are going to shake perpendicular to this direction D1, okay? And when we shake, what is going to happen now, this is the Brillouin zone, it is also a hexagon in K space, and the Giracons are here at the corners of this Brillouin zone. So what happens when I start shaking is that I will now change my gamma one because I'm shaking perpendicular to gamma one. Gamma one is not going to be affected. I am just going to change gamma two in the same way as I'm going to change gamma three because they are equally affected by the shaking. So which means that if I start from a point where the three hoppings, gamma one, gamma two, and gamma three are equal, I am starting from this corner, I will move along the green line here up. So what happens is that from my, when I start from this configuration A, where I have the six Giracons in my brilliant zone, when I reach this point B, when gamma one is 0, 05 of gamma two and gamma three, I go to this very special point where I have parabolic band touching in one direction and the linear band touching in the other direction. And immediately after that point, I enter into the region C where I have lost the Giracons. They have merged and annihilated. And I open a gap in my system. So you see that they are moving here along these red arrows in the Brillouin zone. And here, precisely in the middle, they annihilate. So this is a way to merge the Girac points. Another way that we could have would be to have not really the merging, but to get the alignment. So now I am going to shake along this gamma one here line, okay? So when I shake along this line, I would in principle renormalize everybody, but I can do a way to keep gamma two and gamma three equal and just to renormalize gamma one. I could readjust the, the, the potential barriers. But otherwise, I would be just moving diagonally. But here it's easier for pedagogical reasons to think that I'm just renormalizing gamma 1. But in this case, what happens is that now this Gita cone will move up and this Gita cone will move down. So as I come down here to this line, gamma 1 equals 0, what will happen is that I'm going from this A configuration here when everybody's equal to the G, where I have gamma two equal to gamma three, but gamma one equals zero. And then my system is going to form Dirac lines. So, and these lines are along these lines here. Uh, we had been predicting this long ago in 2012, but now they are getting also these nodal lines with vial fermions and people are very excited about them they were already discussed in the context of graphene long ago. In this case, you never open a gap because if you keep shaking, you will go back to this configuration. You just oscillate between the two. So it is very nice that we can manipulate our spectrum so much by simply shaking and how much the direction of the shaking influences the kind of things that we are going to obtain. So the... the uh, merging or diff, uh, uh, of the Giracons has been seen experimentally, but not in the way how we have been predicting. But instead, in the group of Tillman Eslinger, they were superposing two square lattices, one on top of each other, slightly rotated and with different parameters. And with this, he could construct an anisotropic Giracone that had the different Fermi velocities in different directions, okay? So that was uh, what I wanted to say in terms of an introduction about 
what we could get in terms of properties of shaking lattices linearly. So until now, I was shaking the lattice, okay? So now, I would like to move for, forward and shake in a completely different way to try to realize the Young's idea of eta pairing superconductivity and correlated hopping models. This is something that we published in 2014, and it was mostly a work done by Marco Giliberto and Charles Crafield, supervised by Ghia Giapparizzi and myself. So probably you don't know what is eta pairing superconductivity or correlated hopping models, so I'm going to explain that now. So, if we start from the Hubbard model, that's what uh, C. N. Young from the Young-Mills theory did in 1989, right after the discovery of the high TCs. He started looking at the Hubbard model, and he said, let's define an operator that he called eta daga p, which is nothing but the Fourier transform of some on-site pairs. So I have an operator, I'm talking about fermions now. You see I had an U with NI up, NI down, so I'm talking fermions with the spin up and down. I am going to form a pair on site, site J's, with the spin up and the spin down, and this is the Fourier transform, and it gives me an operator eta daga P, the momentum of the pair. And he also defines an eta z, which is the one minus the occupation number of the site j, summed for all j's. And what he realized is that if he defines is eta z, Oi. Okay. I try again. It systematically goes down after a few minutes. So it is unstable. It can't. Okay. Play from current slide. Okay. So what uh, Young realized is that these eta operators form an SU2 algebra. And the commutation relations of H and eta daga is U times eta daga. So the implications are that we are able to then form this eta pairing eigenstates by simply applying this eta daga pi any times on the vacuum. And that this state is going to show off-diagonal long-range order. So we are talking one dimension. It's very difficult to prove that you have superconductivity in one dimension. What does this mean? And, but what he has shown is that if you look at the, the, the correlation function, okay, C daga I, C daga I, C J, C J, and if this single particle density is, is you are able to factorize it in a term that depends only on i times a term that order, and this implies Meissner effect, which is synonymous of superconductivity. That's the way how you show superconductivity in 1G. So he has shown all that, and this was very nice because we had these nice pairs uh, uh, in this system, in this Hubbard model, but there was a point that this eta pairing superconductor was never the ground state. And uh, a few years ago, the group of Peter Zoller has been trying to find a way to create this state out of equilibrium to, to generate it. But the question is still, it's still an open question and a big dream to realize these eta pairs as a ground state. So to summarize for you, eta, eta superconductivity implies pairs with radius zero. So it's an on-site pairing. They carry momentum pi, 
and this is a state that also appears for repulsive interaction. So it's very interesting. It's superconductivity, although you have repulsive interactions. U positive. Okay? But it's not a ground state. Okay. So now, since this work by uh, Cian Yang appeared, many people have been trying to build models, very complicated models that pick up half of a page of a PRL with lots, lots of terms to try to engineer a Hamiltonian that could realize the eta pair as a ground state. So there have been many efforts along this direction. And what I am going to show you today is what can you do using driven systems. Okay, so suppose that I have a model Hamiltonian, so I will remain in one dimension with fermions in an optical lattice that is described by a Hubbard model, but now in the U term, in the Hubbard U, instead of having just the constant U as before, I will have a driving term which is the constant u plus some u1 cosine omega t. It's a periodic driving. I will show you later how to realize this experimentally. For the moment, please just take it as a model. Okay? So now with this driven interaction, we can use Floquet theory to try to derive some effective time-independent model in the limit when the frequency is much larger than the bare hopping j and the constant u term. You will do this, and again, you are going to get Bessel functions. And these Bessel functions now, they are going to be a bit more complicated because they will have the densities in their argument. So they are not going to be just a function of the shaking parameter k, which is the amplitude of the shaking u1 divided by the frequency, but they will also depend on densities. Basically, the hopping of spin up is going to be controlled by the densities of spin down in the two sites between which it's hopping. So you get a very complicated term, but if you have fermions, your problem can be simplified further because these occupation numbers can be just zero or one. So then you can sum several of these complicated terms that you obtain, and you end up with this very simple effective Hamiltonian. Let's look at what we have here. So we have a term u as we had before. And my hopping j now became slightly more complicated. So I have this daga icj as before multiplied by 1. But now I have some other things multiplying this daga icj, which is this term, Bessel function minus 1, multiplied by Hello. Okay. So I had stopped in the effective Hamiltonian where we had a U term that was normal. And the hopping term minus J, C dag I, C J was multiplied by one plus something that it was this Bessel function of the shaking, of the shaking parameter. But this term is multiplied by density operators now, NEI, NEJ minus two NEI, NEJ with the opposite spin than the one that is hopping. 
So it is a very interesting Hamiltonian where I have four operators or six operators even for this term, but they are not in the interaction, but they are in the hopping. Is the Sidaga ICJ multiplied by two more operators? I and everything is being tuned here by this term. You can immediately see from here that if it is J naught of K, which, which is this Bessel function, if it is, is one, one minus one zero, everything disappears. And I get back to the bare Hubbard model. But let us start now looking at what happens when this Bessel function is zero, when we reach the zero of the Bessel function, okay? So this disappears, the J naught disappears, and I get one minus this operators multiplying the Sidaga ICJ. So in this limit, what happens is that this model becomes what is called a correlated hopping model. This correlated hopping model has been studied a lot, is still in the context of the high TC superconductors at the end of the 80s, beginning of the 90s. So let's see what we can do in that case. So in that case, what happens is, is that we get a slave particle mapping. We can rewrite our Hamiltonian in that way, where we are going to have zeros, which are holons, fermions, which can be up or down, and doublons, which is an up and an down at site j's. So this one I write as creating an operator empty in the vacuum. Here I'm creating fermions on the vacuum with the spin sigma. And here are the doublons that I'm creating on the vacuum. And using this slave particle mapping, we are able to rewrite the Hamiltonian in that way. So the U now acts as a chemical potential for the doublons. And you see that here I have processes where I am going from the holons into fermions and from the doublons into fermions. But I don't mix up doublons and holons. These two things are not coupled together. So I can get processes like this, where I take a doublon from here and put it there. So I'm exchanging a fermion and a doublon. I could have another process like this. I am exchanging a fermion with a holon so a fermion with a holon, but I cannot have a process like this, where I have been exchanging a doublon with a holon. Doublons and holons don't trade place. They remain in their positions. I can just play with the fermions in between. Another one that's forbidden is this. I cannot trade directly a holon with a doublon, okay? So in this case, the eta symmetry we, we have this eta symmetry with momentum pi, and the slave particle number is conserved. So we can then solve this problem and get in this phase diagram. This was done by Liliana Arachea and Alija in 1994. As I said, they were studying the, the correlated hopping model because of high TC cuprates. And you basically see that you have U the bare U, and here is the, the, the number of particles. And basically, you see you have a regime where you have fermions and holons, fermions and doublons. Here you have everybody, fermions, doublons, and holons. And here, only the bosons, the doublons and the holons, no fermions, okay? And what is very interesting in this model, when the Bessel function was zero, is that this phase has Eta, pairing, eta pairs. It has eta pairing superconductivity. The problem is that this state is degenerate with many others. And the hope is to be able to change something in this model to access the eta pairing as a ground state that could be realized. So what we tried to do is that we went beyond J naught of K equals zero. So now you insert a finite J naught of K, and now your slave boson model changes a bit because now you can annihilate a holon and a doublon to create two fermions. So this type of process that was 
not allowed before to annihilate a doublon and a holon. You see here I have a doublon and a, a, a holon. Uh, you annihilate both and create two fermions. Now this is allowed. So I got more possibilities in the system. I lose the conservation of these individual slave particles. We remove the ground state degeneracy and get a hand on some emergent eta superconductivity. So this is the other model. Uh, let me now show you the results from the quantum Monte Carlo for feeling one. We are fixing the, the feeling. It was published there. I will use J naught of K, I will call it gamma, to put labels in this plot because it, otherwise it's too long. So gamma equal one is Hubbard model. Gamma equals zero is the model I have solved before. And we are going what, to look what happens in between. Okay, so you see that I, I am going to have spin and charge sectors. I am going to look at the structure function in the two sectors. And what you see is that if I am at positive u equal 4, I am going to have a spin density wave. I had this antiferromagnetism in the Hubbard model, but it's getting even stronger. You see the blue line as I reduce my gamma, it gets even stronger. And I have, when I go from the positive U to the negative U, is being maps into charge. Hello. Okay. So if we have U equals zero, no interaction, then what we are getting here, you see that you go from the Hubbard model that has no structure. Não estamos, não estamos vendo a imagem. Ah, deixa eu... A sua apresentação. Desconecta okay. e conecta novamente. Espera um pouquinho só, deixa eu tentar. Uh, só, por que será que ele não deu? Ok, vou, vou desligar. Agora sim. Sim. Share screen. The entire screen. Start. Ok? Ok, pronto. Ok. So, we were now at U equals zero, where you have no structure in the Hubbard model for the charge and for the spin. And what you see is that as you come to gamma equals 0, 2, the gamma is the Bessel function in terms of the shaking, you will start getting a peak in the charge and in the spin sector. So this is a coexistence of a spin and charge density waves. We have up, down, up, down, doublon, holon, so two particles, zero particles, two particles, zero particles, okay? We get a spin and charge density wave with the same periodicity. And if now we go to U negative, for instance, equal minus two, we get a very interesting phase with incommensurate order. We see that the spin order, the charge order moves above pi over two, and the spin order moves below pi over two. So this is very interesting because this seems to be reminiscent of what we are observing in high TC cuprates 
in terms of charge ordering. So we have this coexist coexistence of spin and charge density waves or stripes, which are incommensurate, and they look pretty much like the things in 2D. The person whom you're trying to reach is currently on. Hello? If I stop, I finish and I stop and you don't stop. Okay, let's see what they want. It is. Our time, the hours. Ok, então eu tento voltar. Com licença, professora, não imagem. De novo? De novo. Ok, deixa eu tentar, porque aqui ele me aparece como se eu tivesse... Não, aqui aparece, aqui aparece hum? carregando. Ok, deixa eu tentar de novo. Ok. Share screen. Ok? Ok. Let me try. <coughs> A gente está carregando a imagem. Tá. Funcionou? Ainda não. Ainda não? Acho que não. Not yet? Não? Não. Também o horário, talvez seja o horário que as linhas congestionam. Não sei. Carregou? Ainda não. Então acho que é melhor desligar e tentar de novo. É verdade. Oi. Ok. Ainda continua. Está sem vídeo Carregou. ainda. Hã? Continua sem vídeo. Está só a, a sua voz. Que estranho. Porque o meu está no verde. Aqui aparece carregando, mas não chega a concluir. Queixo de ação. Ela estava faltando um slide da minha apresentação. Tá bom, mas então, se, se vocês estão me ouvindo, eu acho que eu vou tentar terminar assim mesmo, senão eu vou atrasar muito vocês. 
né? O que, que você acha? Tá bom, se conseguimos acabar em três minutos, seria perfeito. A gente consegue, eu acho que o meu aluno não... So let me try now then uh, to summarize without any image. I can't show you the last slide about the fish balance, but it is possible to use the fish bar oh, resonance. Yes, can you see now? Sim, apareceu, mas tentamos de acabar rápido porque talvez ele vai desaparecer novamente. Yes. Okay. So you can control the scattering length by controlling the magnetic field via the Feshbach resonance. And the idea is to use potassium 40, which has a, a, a resonance at B0 equal to 224, so it's around here, with a width of 9.7. And what we have been calculating to show that if we shake around the zero, not around the Feshbach resonance itself, but around the zero of B here, we should be able to get parameters for potassium 40 where this would be possible to be realized. So one could use this, if not for generating it pairing, at least for intensifying magnetism in the systems because the, the antiferromagnetism gets much stronger in that case. Okay, so I come to the conclusions. It's possible to generate new simulators for strongly correlated fermionic systems. Uh, in this case, we had a coexisting spin and charge in commensurate orders. Exotic states like eta pairing superconductivity could be achieved in optical lattices. And it is still unclear what would happen in higher dimensions to this correlated hopping model. Let me acknowledge especially Marco Di Liberto, who was one who did most of the work, Charles Crefield and Ghia Giapparizzi. I didn't tell you about the work of the others. And for the shaking of the honeycomb latches, it was Selma Corre in collaboration with Mark Gerbig and Li King Lim. So I think that unfortunately we are not going to do the other half of the talk that was supposed to be about the more recent work that Anton Quelle was going to tell you. It's a 2017 preprint which is now going to appear in New Journal of Physics, which is how to realize a topological uh, uh, Floquet system which has no counterpart in uh, undriven systems and uh, competition between quantum hole and quantum spin hole effect in the systems. So these are the, the more recent works we have been doing, but uh, with all this going on and off, uh, we lost too much time. So I am afraid we would be completely out of time. So I imagine we should finish. Yes, thanks. I thank you very much for your attention and I am very sorry for the, the bad connection.